Our guest today, Dr. Rudy Abersold, explains mass spectrometry, one of the most important technologies in understanding human biological function. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 76. It's time to proteo me. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Kaleidograph, a thoughtfully designed graphing and data analysis application for research scientists, as well as those in business and engineering fields. Try Kaleidograph for 45 days, risk-free. Receive a 20% discount if you purchase Kaleidograph within the next 60 days. Visit www.synergy.com forward slash podcast.htm for more details. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent. For humans, that would be equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Sun's the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier. Today, we're going to do a second part in a two-part series on proteomics. Um, proteomics is at a stage right now um, that it is sort of a burgeoning field Although, well, it's been around for a while, but it's right about to make uh, quantum leaps in providing information that can be used for, uh, and in a way that we can and will probably revolutionize modern medicine. And it is pretty heavy, um, a pretty heavy technology. Um, in my mind, I sort of visualize it as the tricorder, um, where you run a scan and it tells you who you are, what you are, and... Uh, you know, what kind of, what state you're in. Um, so it, to help me out with the interview, I've invited uh, a guest host. Um, you know him well. <laughs> it's Vincent Racniala from This Week in Virology, This Week in Parasitism, and a new podcast This Week in Microbiology. Uh, and he's a professor at Columbia University in the Department of uh, Microbiology. Welcome, Vincent. Thanks for having me back, Mark. And I, I just want to note to everyone that Mark, five minutes ago, sent me 10 papers of Rudy's to read. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> we're, still, we're still working on them. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the fun part about doing Futures in Biotech is that you can bring the authors on and have them talk about their work and get a first-hand account. We're not going to interpret this for you. Uh, we're not going to... Uh, you know, summarize it in uh, a five-minute uh, take, or if it was on TV, in three sound bites. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Rudolf uh, Ebersold. He is a uh, professor at the um, University of Zurich in Switzerland, and he's also um, the, the founder or the. Uh, he started up a new institute called the Institute for Molecular Systems Biology. Uh, which is part of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Uh, did I get that right, Dr. Ebersold? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, you got it right. I'm in Zurich. There's two universities, a technical university called ETH. That's a federal technical university and the University of Zurich. And I have a joint appointment, so I'm in, I'm in both. I'd like to also mention uh, that... You uh, co-founded the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington, um, with uh, Dr. Lee Hood, who was on the show early on in the first uh, year, I think it was. Um, and and Lee Hood was is you know famous for having invented the um, uh, automated DNA sequencer, among other things. Among he's, he he transformed a lot of the technologies that enabled the Human Genome Project, um, and was an early participant in the initiative. Uh, so just to put uh, 
a little perspective on who we're talking to. Uh, we have someone who's uh, deeply involved in, in modernizing uh, the tools we have for uh, modern uh, 21st century biotech. Um, so could you maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, the Institute for Systems Biology. I'd certainly like to tie that in so that people can go back three or four years of futures in biotech and, and see the, uh, have, have a little bit of a connection here. So, um, can, can you tell us how that got started and what the objective was with the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. So there's actually a third person who was involved in founding it, a third co-founder, and that's Alan Adarum, who is an infection biologist. And the uh, Institute got started out of the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, Lee and I were in the same department. Lee was the chair and I was a faculty member in, in a department there. And Alan was in a neighboring department. And we, in, in our department, which was called Molecular Biotechnology, uh, there was a lot of technology development going on for high, throup high throughput biology. So you mentioned already Lee's role in, um, in, in genomic sequencing. There were also groups that worked on high throughput SNP detection, computational biologists, and, um, and two groups, John Yates and our group, worked on very early on on proteomics. And so we, we all worked on technologies which, which needed to be expanded and needed to be applied at high throughput. We didn't have the, the space and we didn't have the resources at the university to really scale up. And therefore, the idea came up to basically move out and rent a building and start an institute where all these technologies which, which are basically synergistic uh, could be implemented at high throughput in the same building in a coordinated fashion. So this was uh, essentially the root of the Institute for Systems Biology. Was it funded in part by uh, Gates? Because it was in Seattle. I, I'm, I'm not so there, there was, so, so basically the, the Institute was and still is uh, grant funded for the most part. There is a bit of endowment money. Some came actually from Bill Gates in a in the form of some of some matching scheme, and uh, there were some other uh, donations and gifts from other individuals, which were highly um, welcome, of course, and critical, especially early on in the institute. But it is is essentially a soft money place where research is funded by grants and contracts, mostly grants from the NIH and NSF and so on. I was just in uh, Seattle last week, Rudy, and uh, I was having breakfast and someone pointed out to me that building across the street is where the, the Institute of Systems Biology is expanding into. Uh, it was the former right. Rosetta building. I don't know if you knew exactly. Rosetta when you were there. Yes, I, I, I didn't know them very well. And that's true. The whole institute is moving uh, basically across to the Lake, Lake Union in Seattle to a new building which is in the neighborhood of... Um, of, of, um, of where Amazon is, and that's basically right. a, a very mm -hmm. dynamic area in Seattle. Yeah, I was there, and, and it's had, this has had a big effect on science in Seattle. I visited a virologist who began doing systems biology maybe five or eight years ago as a direct influence from uh, Lee Hood. Yeah, I think the Institute has had a pretty significant impact, and that's uh, it's great to see. There's many, many institutes, systems biology institutes and departments now and uh, and I think it's it's fun to say that um, the ISP in Seattle was the first. Maybe you could tell us uh, or help define what systems biology is. We could maybe talk about uh, systems biology as sort of a uh, you know from thirty seven thousand feet here, then move towards uh, proteomics, and then really dig into the mass uh, spectroscopy. Sort of, in, and <laughs> I don't want to telegraph what we're doing here, but uh, it really helps to in, to piece this up in my head here <laughs> because this is gonna be it, it with respect to the last episode it was very very uh, with John Bergeron and Tommy Nielsen they were fantastic but um, I got a lot of feedback from listeners suggesting that it might be good to uh, they're they're gonna listen twice uh, to really catch it and I actually listened back to it twice as as usual with uh, with John Bergeron um, perhaps you could tell us what uh, systems biology is and where it fits into the context of understanding uh, living organisms uh, yeah, so I can, I mean, it's, it's hard, it's a, it's a difficult thing to define, and a lot of people have tried, there's lots of definitions around, but in, in, in essence, I think it is to get at the context, contexts 
of how molecules interact with each other to carry out biological function. I think it's it was apparent from an actually big surprise from the genome project that when the human genome was sequenced, that there was, an, and, this, and the genomes from other species, such as the mouse and the flies and worms, that they all contain similar numbers of uh, protein coding um, regions, basically protein coding genes. And so this created a bit of a problem because one would need to explain how uh, arguably more complex biological function like our brain functions, which presumably flies and worms are not doing, would be carried out with essentially the same number of elements, namely proteins. So, so then the, it, it immediately became apparent, and seeing a lot of data have been accumulated since, that biological function are not carried out by individual components like proteins and microRNAs and so on, but it's a coordinated fashion. The, the ensemble of molecules carry out functions and control processes. So um, to me, systems biology is essentially the understanding how these molecules cooperate in represented maybe in the form of um, interaction or networks in general to carry out specific functions. And it's assumed that these networks or how the molecules are arranged um, are responsible or critical for how the how the function uh, looks like. So in, in many ways, I, I, I sometimes use the analogy to, la to language where we have become very good in understanding, reading the words, we learn the letters, we can assemble letters into words. But even if you could read a whole dictionary and every word in a dictionary were known to us, we still would not understand a text like a newspaper text or a text in a book if we don't know also the syntax. That syntax is how the individual words are assembled in a sentence to convey a meaning to the reader. So, so in, my, in, in, in that way of thinking, the um, systems biology is the search for the syntax of biological information. So that may be a very, very brief abbreviation or brief description. So when, you, when you do systems biology, you, part of it is proteomics, obviously, and part of yeah. it is uh, trans, transcriptomics. What else is in there as well? So it's, it's um, I think proteomics has an important role to fill because obviously many, many functions are based on proteins or ensembles of proteins. Uh, clearly, many other molecules and their interactions play a role. You mentioned transcripts. I would pull out, would uh, also nominate microRNAs, which are highly, uh, highly researched these days. Of course, lipids, general structure, um, how the molecules are organized and compartmentalized in cells. But it is mostly, I think, related to the interactions among these groups of, of molecules to form uh, networks that have uh, particular properties and that these properties are reflect reflected eventually in phenotypes that are measurable. Let me s s take it just a quick step back here uh, before we move forward. Um, I, I want to explain this because uh, there's, you know, a spectral of, of folks with various uh, backgrounds that are listening. Um, so the way I understand it, you were in your analogy of uh, systems bio biology is the science of understanding the syntax to the language of life. Whereas uh, if, you know, the genome project identified what the words were and you could understand how a gene is structured and what that gene encodes for which protein, um, and so which is the words, then I, I suppose in the 80s and 90s, first half of the 90s, much of that was uh, being done. That was the approach to biology, molecular biology. And then the next phase was characterizing the individual proteins, uh, which were the words. Where are, they, where are they made? What part of the cell are they? What time? When are they made? Where they go? And then the systems of biology is now taking all that information and revisiting it in a way that looks at them in a completely comprehensive way, right? It's kind of like a, taking a snapshot or uh, not even a snapshot, or it could be a movie of the entire living organism uh, um, at down to the molecular level, right? Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. I think you are entirely right. A lot of molecular biology was focused in the 90s and 80s on 
on deciphering and enumerating the molecules. And it's gotten very good. I think the, in doing that, I think the prototypical and most successful of these enterprises is the Genome Project, which now can crank out the genomic sequence in a, at, an, at an absolutely mind mind blowing speed and accuracy. But it still basically um, enumerates the, the elements, I mean, the letters and the words of the genetic information. If you want to understand how it works, we need to, we need to understand the context. I mean, I mentioned the word syntax. I think this, this is the shift. And it, it does not have to be so grandiose that one wants to understand or model or basically uh, visualize the whole cell. That, of course, is eventually a long-term goal. I think the, the the, the long-term goal clearly is to get an understanding of the cell or even an organism at the molecular level and molecular interactions. But I think the, there is a lot of very interesting um, studies that don't have such, take such a grandiose view and focus on a particular signal, a system. So that system could be a signaling system or, for instance, could be metabolism in a cell or it could be uh, how a particular uh, regulatory circuit functions. And many of these even relatively confined questions are inherently very complex and poorly understood. So I think even very confined questions that biologists have been interested in for a long time can be addressed and approached and also interpreted in a system, from a systems biology point of view in an entirely new light, not as an ensemble of molecules that carry out, each one carry out the function, but as a, basically a city or a community of elements that contribute to a particular phenotype in the form of um, of a network in, of interacting molecules. Is that some, somewhat like as you build the puzzle sort of with a shotgun, there's enough parts that fit in correctly that you can now make out the space between those parts and say, oh, by the way, yeah, that gene that we didn't know what it did, that protein that it encoded, had no clue. It now fits in that network because it's coming up on the mass spec or, or on, on in the systems analysis. We can now figure out what it does. Is that Yes, that's certainly an important point of it. That one, there's a, there's a lot of molecules where no one knows what they're actually doing, and so I think one one important component of this type of analysis is is to so to speak assign functions. I mean molecular functions to individual uh, molecules, for instance proteins. But I think there's also there's also a greater picture here that the the molecules together carry out a cellular function. So, I mean, I, I tend to distinguish between, between a catalytic function of, let's say, a protein. For instance, a protein may be a kinase, or a protein may be a, a, a hydrolase. And that is what a biochemist would measure if he isolates that protein and does an in vitro assay. But the protein has also a cellular function that is usually not carried out by this molecule alone, but in, a co in coordination with many other molecules. So a protein kinase might have a biochemical function of phosphorylating another protein, but it might have a cellular function of controlling, for instance, a cell cycle. And I think it's this kind of higher level functions, cellular functions, that one would like to address with, um, with systems biology approaches. Um, Is, I, I, isn't it true that um, basically the data that you generate then leads to experiments in many other different disciplines? So uh, you, you find out that certain protein levels change and then uh, others have to go on and take that data and, and try and figure out why that is so. So you feed into many other disciplines. Uh, yes, so I, I think the way I view kind of the systems biology experimental and, and general ex uh, um, approach landscape and how we approach the problem, I think it has three really important elements. And one element is that we need to generate, or any project that wants to take the systems approach, needs to generate high quality data set that quantitatively describe the system studied. And, and the second component is clearly a computational or th theoretical component which tries to integrate and explain this information from the biological um, network or biological phenotype point of view. And the third component, which is oftentimes in many studies neglected or, or underrepresented, is a hypothesis so, or, or a biological system that's well defined. Oftentimes, systems biology has a bit of a bad reputation and, and some people mistakenly think that it is just going out and collecting a huge amount of data uh, in, in basically in a random un or uncoordinated fashion and to feed this data somehow in a computer and out, could, out should come some useful information. Such projects are um, 
are, are criticized correctly uh, because they tend to be not very successful. I think those projects are very successful, where there is a, a well-defined question, a well-defined system, and these systems can be manipulated. And we basically observe by repeat molecular observation at the protein or transcript or lipid level how the system reacts. And then these data from basically multiple snapshots are then integrated computationally and analyzed. So I think it's not just data collection, it's data collection, very systematic, quantitative um, and complete data collection on the system in differentially perturbed states. And that is really, um, this is really a challenge for many of the analytical sciences, particularly also for proteomics. So listening to you, to you say that, I wonder if in fact, you, you are in favor of solving the entire human proteome because it sounds like that would be a, a non-hypothesis uh, driven uh, approach or whether you favor focused uh, proteomic studies. Okay, so I, 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 fa I favor both. I favor that we, the notion that we need to know how the pr human proteome is composed. I do, I do, however, think that at least at this current technical level we are at, it is not a realistic assumption that we can measure the human proteome under various perturbed conditions repeatedly and reproducibly and quantitatively. So what I, what I think, and that's, the, that's basically the, the path we're pursuing, that we establishing uh, or attempting to establish a complete map of the human proteome basically a base, a base level representation of how, how this proteome looks like in a mass spectrometer. And then we, we derive from that basic map essentially the coordinates how each protein can be addressed and how each protein looks like in a mass spectrometer. So that we then can form hypotheses and measure specific sets of proteins highly reliably and highly sensitively. So basically we're, we're, we're proposing and, and have to to a large extent implemented that the proteome, human proteome is mapped out, kind of like a, like a street view map of a city, and that each element then has an address that can be recognized with a digital device, and that digital device is, is effectively a mass spectrometer, and that we can then ask the mass spectrometer using, the in, using its measurement capability plus the prior information from the map to essentially correctly identify and quantify any protein that we want to quantify and detect. So in, 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 in essence, we would, we, we, we would like to establish the ability to measure any protein, but we accept that we cannot measure in every study every protein repeatedly, but those proteins that we, don't, that we want to measure, because they may be constituting the signaling system that we want to study, or an organelle, or whatever the question may be, so all of these proteins that are relevant to the question, we then can then measure rep reproducibly and with high quantitative accuracy. So when, when we did the human genome, it was easy because the DNA in all of our cells is the same. You could take cheek cells or blood cells, you sequence it, it's basically the same. But in proteomics, it's different because the proteins are different in every cell. So when we talk about solving the base human proteome, the map, as you say, where does that come from? Cells and culture, blood cells, liver, brain? Do, do we know? Yeah. yeah, very good question. And I, and I think this is exactly the dilemma and what's discussed a lot in proteomic circles. And um, so what's the end point? How do we know we have the whole proteome um, uh, identified and, and questions like that? So we, we, we initially thought um, that if we were to collect proteins, uh, protein data, let's say mass spectrometry files, from various uh, research um, groups around the world who, who work on human proteins. And they, if they were to, co to collect the data whatever in whatever system they work in, some in heart cells, maybe some in lymphocytes and, and liver or whatever, and if you were to compile the, these spectra in a composite map, that eventually we would have every protein identified of the human body. So we started such a project a, a while back, uh, maybe six or six years ago, and this project we call the Peptide Atlas Project, and it still resides at the um, at the at the Systems Biology Institute in Seattle. So then we we found out that this is going to be a very long and hard way, because the same proteins are redundantly identified hundreds or thousand times over, 
But when, we pl when, when you plot the number of proteins identified in such large-scale um, studies against the, the um, endpoint where you would like to be, let's say all the proteins that are defined by genomics as, as protein coding sequences, then we, we noticed it's very hard to get up to 100%. So, we, which actually is an interesting point, maybe we can discuss this a little later. But we then, we then took another approach. We said we know from genomics and the computer prediction tools that annotate this, the sequences in the genome, which regions should be protein coding. And then we use computer tools to predict which peptides a mass spectrometer would detect if that predicted protein were in a sample, even if this peptide uh, had never been observed or the protein had never been observed before by a mass spectrometer or for that matter by any other method. And then we, synth we chemically synthesize these peptides, which can be done now very fast and quite cheaply. So we synthesized um, more, more than 150,000 uh, peptides and, and we, we maintain, I mean, this is not, this is, not, um, this is the, the, uh, the assumption that these proteins uh, these peptides collectively represent every human protein that uh, can be that will be found because that's what is what uh, is represented in the human genome and then we generated reference spectra for all these peptides so we basically have now a database which uh, contains the hu the whole human proteome in a way uh, in in a in a in a form of reference spectra that are clearly correct and, and authentic, uh, authentically represent the peptides that we expect to be produced by any human protein. And this is redundant, so we have about, in the average, uh, four to five such peptides, basically signatures, four or five independent signatures for each protein of the human protein. And, we, and so this allows us now to say that even though certain proteins have not been identified, we can now go and look for them and ask specifically the question, is this peptide, if this, is this protein present or is it not present? So it's the equivalent of having an antibody or two or five antibodies that are specific for each protein and, and except that the assay that we use is not an ELISA assay and we don't actually use an antibody, but we use a mass spectrometric targeting assay. So, uh, so, so, clear. so last week, uh, I think it was one of either Bergeron or Nielsen who referred to an antibody technique that you had developed, but in fact, this is what he was meaning, the peptide uh, libraries, right? Not, not making exactly. antibodies against them. Okay. No, we're not making, we're not making pe uh, antibodies against them. We synthesize them, then we, we generate okay. basically a fingerprint that is a unique in indicator that this peptide has been detected or, uh, or, or, or to put it in other words, this is how the peptide would look like to a mass spectrometer if it was detected. I mean, if, if it was in the right. sample. Right. Now, when, um, when you do mass spectrometry on a sample, uh, you're looking to compare the peptides generated with this library. Now, if, the, if in the cell the protein is modified by phosphorylation or some other post-translational modification, how does that affect uh, what, this, what the machine sees compared to these peptides? Okay, so it's a very good point, very, of course, a very important question. So the, the peptide that is detected by the mass spectrometer this, of this method can be modified or can be unmodified, but you have to know what, what the peptide is, whether it's modified or not. So this is exactly as if you raise an antibody against a protein um, or a peptide for that matter, you will need to know whether the peptide or the epitope is, is a phosphorylated sequence or, or not. So uh, right now, the level of resolution that we have is that we have for every protein sequence at the level of the Uniprot um, database. So this is about the 20,300 protein sequences. We have these targeting assays, actually not quite for all of them, but it's about for, um, for about 99% of these 20,300 sequences. So we're well aware of the fact that many proteins, maybe all, are somehow modified, well aware of the issue of SNPs, splice forms, and so on. And these can, at present, not be generally distinguished. It is, however, only a question of time and effort to also generate these assays for modified peptides 
or SNPs. And in fact, we have already done um, generated these assays for all the SNPs that have a reasonably high frequency in the human um, in the human proteome. So I think the 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 um, approach that we've taken to to deal with the proteomic complexity is a stepwise approach that we first say we would like to just make statements, quantitative statements about the protein uh, in the sense of a product of the product of a particular locus. And later on, we are planning and on a process of extending this approach to modification SNPs, splices and so on that could then be equally interrogated um, down the road. Let, let me ask you, so you're, you're, you basically take a biological sample, <clears throat> you inject it into the machine, you, pre you prep it, the machine takes the sample and runs uh, an analysis of the molecular content. And John was saying that it had the sensitivity of one-tenth of a proton for the molecules, the constituents, so you separate the molecules you add an enzyme to digest the protein into small little subparts, yeah. and it flies through. You identify what's there. Their machine tells you what's there, but uh, that's pretty much running blind. And that you you require, if this I understand correctly, you require an algorithm to say, well, you know, going after the billion or quadrillion possibilities of how those components interplay, you focus your work with an algorithm. Or your analysis with an algorithm that says, we, we're going to look at these 300 genes or these 200 genes from chromosome 21 specifically. Are they present and how, how much are they present? Is that how it works? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. So, so <laughs> <Yeah>. the, <laughs> the, the um, yeah, it's, um, it's great. It's hard stuff. <laughs> the, traditional, the traditional proteomic mes methods were basically what, every, what, what everyone refers to as shotgun method. So there is exactly what you, what you said initially, right? You, you, you take a, a sample of proteins, you digest the sample of proteins with a protease to make pieces, peptides basically, and then you inject these peptides into a mass spectrometer. And the mass spectrometer will pick out one after the other every, let's say, about every tenth of a second will pick out of the pool of, of peptides present one and will will identify its um, amino acid sequence by, by a process that we can maybe discuss or maybe John, John and Tommy have discussed that. But basically about every tenth or every two tenths of a second a peptide can be identified. So now if we... If we imagine that each pro each cell contains thousands of different proteins, and each protein, if digested, generates maybe in the range of a hundred or so of peptides, that even at that very high speed, it takes potentially a very long time to eat, basically discover all the all the peptides. And this is this is uh, still um, a very difficult task. Discover thousands of proteins can take a very long time, and that's why we thought that it would be an effective way to, to basically front load the whole system with information and generate this map. And then the biologist would come in and say, I'm interested in these 100 or 200 or 300 or 1,000 proteins, but I want to make sure that these proteins which matter for my biological question are always and reproducibly and reliably, me reliably measured. And so that's why this, I think this targeting method for systems biology is a great technique because it does generate highly, highly reproducible and, and highly complete uh, data sets for the In, system that is being studied. The genome, when it was first analyzed, it was done by mapping out the clones that, that, that existed in, in their position on the various chromosomes and then sort of sequencing them and then tying the information um, you know, piece by piece. The puzzle was assembled and annotated. Uh, do you think, and now it's, shot, it's shotgun, you digest, throw the digested DNA into a machine and uh, it assembles the information. Do you, do you think uh, shotgun will eventually replace once uh, enough of data is there that it can take less information and figure out the context of the biology? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the shotgun technique as, as well as the targeting peptide technique basically tells you um, what's there or, and tells you the quantity and maybe tells you wh whether the peptide is modified if you do the right measurements. So in that sense, 
uh, one, one snapshot measurement probably doesn't tell you a whole lot of context. I think the context comes in if you basically observe your cell or your system how it reacts to stimuli. I think that's the, that's the uh, basic paradigm of the systems biology experimentation. You tweak, you tweak the system, you push it, you pull it, and you see how it, how it reacts. And uh, the expectation is that if we envisage a biological system as compo uh, basically as a, as a network structure of molecules, you ask what happens if I take one out, how does the system react? And, you, and, and then you take another one out and you say, how does the system react now? And, and by observing the system under, under maybe hundreds of different perturbations or states, then you start to feel, put piece together an understanding how it, how it is structured and how it reacts. And, uh, and for that you need, from an experimental point of view, you need to be able to do these observations reproducibly quite fast and, in, and with accurate, accurate quantification. And, uh, and that's what these mass spectrometric techniques, especially the targeting technique, provide. But currently the targeting technique is limited in the number of proteins that can be measured per unit time. So it's reasonably slow. And what we are trying to do is to develop a technique which basically observes the whole proteome in a short time and quantifies the whole proteome, again based on, on this uh, initial map that we have uh, created. So we work on a, on a new mass spectrometric technique which should basically generate a complete fragment ion map of the whole proteome that's in a, uh, the, all the proteins that are in a sample and then we would relate this, this experimentally generated map to the reference map that we generated in the past to identify as many proteins as possible. I, I, I didn't mean to, I just want to preface this, so that I didn't mean to say that it, you know, wow, it, it would be great if we could transition to a just one sample, entire proteome, all the information in one shot. Um, I, I, I can see how this is, is an absolutely um, uh, formidable task in that unlike the genome where the genome and the uh, newborn infant is going to be the same in the genome when that person turns 100, uh, if, if your analogy is in systems biology is to piece together uh, all the addresses and all the, uh, in a similar way to Google Maps and the mass spectrometer is sort of the car driving around mapping uh, the, the, the globe uh, and, and sort of piecing it all together, that would be the case. But you'd have to do it in every minute of, of the life of that person, well, you know, every minute, every hour, every day, every uh, year following the seasons, the environmental conditions, the, uh, the, the state of health of that individual, if there was an infection coming in or, or an, um, an anomalous physiological state such as disease, you know, um, uh, it, it's just, un it'd be incredible to be able to map everything in the human body down on the molecular level throughout its entire, uh, you know, zero to 100. If, or 140, because yeah, <laughs> that's our potential. Well, right? I think actually you, you make, again, an, a very important and interesting point, which has, which has a lot to do how um, genomics is organized and I think how proteomics should be organized as a, as a science enterprise. So in genomics, it made perfectly good sense to have a few, maybe one, uh, genomic center who, have, who, who streamline their process and carry out this function. And that's, so that's still ongoing, of course, and now they, they, these sequencing centers are enormously successful and fast. In proteomics, I think um, such a, a, a mega sequencing center would make not a whole lot of sense. I mean, you would like, of course, to have a lot of capacity, but exactly as you say, that every, basically every research project that an R01, for instance, in the US supported researchers carrying out almost inevitably will be faced with the question, what are the proteins doing? Can I measure them in hundred different states? And how can I piece this information together? So my, my view on proteomic um, kind of strategy is that there should be tools and resources be generated that allow hundreds or thousands of R01 type researchers to generate high quality data sets on their system. And, not, and it should not be carried out in one big sequencing center. Of course, certain hospitals or certain research centers might build up a massive uh, 
proteomic facility. And I'm not, I'm of course not arguing against that. But what I'm arguing against is, is centralization of the whole proteomics effort. I think it is a decentralized effort because, as exactly as you say, there is, there is thousands and thousands of research questions. They all need and will benefit from ac accurate and reproducible measurements. And that should be done local where the question arises. And in many cases, it's not even necessary to measure every protein that's in a sample. But I think what's necessary is that any protein that matters should be measurable by, by the biologist. So this is, this is uh, my view on how proteomics should be set up. It's also my view on how a human proteome project should be set up. And maybe you discussed this also with John and Tommy last week. And my, my big, um, my big um, goal here would be that through a coordinated human proteome project by providing reagents, tools, know-how and, and methods that a very, very large number of scientists is enabled to measure any protein they want with high precision and accuracy and ease. I just want to second that as somebody who's done virology research for 30 years. I cannot tell you the number of times when we have simply wanted to compare the proteins in a cell that is uninfected versus an infected cell, and we technically cannot do it. And this is exactly what we need to have a local proteomics facility, maybe for the city of New York, that could do such a thing on a service basis. Yeah, and do it fast and, and relatively cheap, right? And, and so there's, of course, many, many facilities, and, and many of them struggle because the techniques that they, that they use are, are extremely challenging. And what we, what we try to, to do with this human proteome project that was also now conceptualized by HUPO is to facilitate basically the transmission or dissemination of the, of the tools and reagents. It simply is not going to be good enough for proteomics if a handful of labs in the world can do wonderful things and everyone else uh, cannot. And so I think this dissemination or enabling component for me has an extremely high prior priority also, of course, for, for um, to, to convince funding agents, agencies that proteomics is a, is, is a high priority item. Tommy Nielsen um, commented and wanted to wanted to emphasize the the, the coordination is critical. I, I I suppose it's kind of like oh, at the moment humanity has discovered that the Earth is in a galaxy and there's billions of stars, and that while not each lab is going to name each one of those stars in a different way, and we're going to map the the universe, each using our own notebook, not talking to each other, because then, well. <laughs> Well, it'll just be a mess, an absolute mess. Mess, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to have to take a minute to thank our sponsor. So this will just take a quick second here, uh, or probably about two minutes. But um, I'd like to, to, to thank uh, Kaleidograph for sponsoring this episode of Futures in Biotech. Um, Kaleidograph is a thoughtfully designed graphing and data analysis application for research scientists, uh, business professionals and engineers. It produces publication quality graphs and easily converts the most complex data into a functional display. Statistics, linear, nonlinear curve fitting, and the ability to produce precise graphic visualization of data all make Kaleidograph powerful and flexible. Um, since 1988, Kaleidograph has been uh, easy to learn graphing uh, an analysis program with surprising at uh, with a surprisingly affordable price. Um, I've had it probably since 1994, 95. Um, no, 96, 96. That was when I got my first Windows machine. So uh, I've been using it since then. Um, it is phenomenal. It, it, uh, it it's not. It's it, it, when you first load it, it looks. I, I recommend that you go give it a try. Go download the the demo. It, it looks like a little bit like a spreadsheet. Um, but uh, you, you put in your data and you can do all kinds of curve fitting, uh, you know, all the, any form of uh, graph, you can try out uh, different uh, types of graphs, curves, lines, tables, pie charts, uh, and, and just manipulate the, the visualization such that you can really see the data. Um, what I use it for um, is for curve fitting. Uh, I spent hours and hours and hours uh, trying to get Excel, which is, you know, uh, an alternative uh, an analytical tool, it just doesn't work. It is horrible at curve fitting. You just cannot throw in an equation. You, whereas Kaleidograph, 
Uh, the, the equations are simple. Uh, they're really, really easy to do, uh, to add. They provide a whole series of examples. Just by looking at examples, you'll learn the syntax in minutes. And um, then you'll be able to model. We, we work in physiology here in the lab using uh, equations that meet the, the biology, right? Not some lesser uh, algorithm that just is incorrect. Uh, so if you want to do physiology right, if you want to do genetics right, if you want to do uh, economics right, get really good stats. This is your tool. It's, uh, it's really inexpensive, and uh, we use it every day in the lab. So uh, try Cladograph for 45 days risk-free. And then uh, if you purchase Cladograph within the next 60 days, you will receive a 20% discount. Visit www.synergy.com forward slash podcast dot htm for more details. All right. Uh, I'd like them to thank thank them uh, for for sponsoring uh, uh, Futures in Biotech. They're, I use them. That's why I recommend them. Um, Great. Let's and learn it, something. We'll try it out. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little program, um, but yet really powerful. You know, when you're just curve fitting, God, <laughs> I, I won't even. I shouldn't expand anymore. But curve fitting is a real pain in the butt, and uh, this is a nice little tool, and it it's, we use it. So, um, and, you know, we like to use sponsor, to have sponsors that, uh, where we can recommend it and because we use it. And uh, that's really cool. Um, so, I, I want to start by saying this is an amazing opportunity for us to talk to you in that uh, we're seeing a transition uh, in the technology of life here going from that, uh, you know, uh, dissection to a global perspective on the molecular function. Molecular biology is going from single gene, single protein analysis to comprehensive systemic uh, organismal level uh, analysis and um, proteomics and mass spectrometry is really opening that, that door and it, it's an, 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 a huge, huge door of information that's going to um, enable all kinds of inf uh, context and understanding of biology. I, I just can't stress it enough. And I'm, I, I think that this is a, a key point in uh, the future in biotech uh, storyline that's going to shift. And we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, coming out of this uh, field. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you, um, perhaps, is if, if you could talk a little bit about... So you had two recent papers, one that came out um in february just like three weeks ago and one in uh december oh yeah um looking at using servicier um one at metabolism to try and picture i mean servicier is a great and and we can uh, i can recommend that people go back and listen to malcolm whiteway's uh episode of futures in biotech where he describes servicier uh saccharomyces servicier as a model um, for biology it's, uh, and genetics, um, you approach two questions, metabolism and uh, you call it the phosphoproteomic analysis. Uh, perhaps I, I'm kind of more interested in the phosphoproteomic analysis uh, because of the implications on uh, controlling uh, what's going on in yeast genetically. Uh, but perhaps, would you prefer uh, giving us a little uh, summary of the, the metabolism work? Or I'll, I'll let it, that, that's the question you, <laughs> you pick. Okay, so, so uh, it's actually, uh, um, so yeah, I'm happy to comment on both uh, quickly. Let, let me start with the metabolism study. So this, this actually, I mean, I wouldn't say it goes back to, but it certainly was encouraged by a visit we had and discussion with uh, David Botstein, who is, of course, a, a very prominent uh, biologist and has done made a lot of contributions to yeast. So he came over when we started this institute in Zurich about six years ago now, and he, he basically said, don't even try to do um, systems biology unless you have made any, any new, have created any new insights into yeast metabolism. So... Um, so of course this is a this is a fairly provocative statement like like David likes to do, but he it, of course in in his, in essence he's right. I mean he would he would his, what he tried to say is there is a system that has been studied by biochemists for for decades for like forty years. Every single enzyme is known, 
So you know every enzyme, you know its sequence, you know to a large extent its catalytic function, your catalytic constants. So there is a system where an enormous amount of information has been accumulated, but yet a lot of things uh, cannot be explained. So this is, of course, the, the exactly the premise of systems biology, that if you know the pieces, you know a lot, but you don't know how the system basically functions as a system. So, so kind of also encouraged by by David's comments and also by the fact that uh, that a, a yeast metabol metabolomics researcher, Uwe Sauer, is a colleague of mine in, in the institute. We started to discuss uh, some 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 studies in around yeast metabolism, and one of the things we studied in this particular paper is the question how do um, yeast uh, isoenzymes behave under various conditions. So I'm, I must for or should explain for those who are not um, so much into biochemistry what isoenzymes are. So isoenzymes are enzymes that are coded for by a different locus in the genome of the yeast or any other genome, they, but they carry out, so they're not sequence identical, but they carry out the same catalytic function. So there may, there may be several, uh, six actually, alcohol dehydrogenases, there is a number of hexokinases, so they do the same thing for a biochemist, but they, there are several genes. Usually this is explained as redundancy in the genome with the idea that if one drops out because it's mutated, the other one will take over. So we tried to study whether this is the case. And the, the study design was simply to put yeast cells into various uh, metabolic steady states where various types of the yeast metabolism would be used. And this is predictable from uh, metabolic models, basically by a computer. Computer will tell us which enzymes should be used. And then we simply measured which enzymes are present, to what extent, under these conditions, at the resolution of each isoenzyme. So, and what we observed was really interesting, and that is that, that and, and actually was largely not known. I mean, there's for some, some isolated cases, this was known, but for, for, from a systematic point of view, this is entirely novel. And the finding was that depending on how the yeast cell reacts and how it metabolizes, it will use preferential different subsets of these isoenzymes. So the cell has, the conclusion is that the cell has at its disposal a number of different, a number of um, enzymes that carry out basically the same biochemical function, but it uses them under various conditions when the cell under different regulatory stresses. So the proteins are not redundant as is frequently assumed. They all carry out a specific biological function, even though the biochemical function is the same. So this is one insight from this study. Another insight was that many proteins that are not used for generations and generations, when the cell is growing in a steady state, and by all no current knowledge of metabolism, the proteins are not used, they're still being synthesized. So, so the question is, of course, why is that? Is, are the cells still just kind of uh, making, making these proteins because they somehow remember for a long time or is there a particular regulatory circuit that keeps these enzymes being made even though they're not used for generations at a time? So these were two, two findings that are out of several but that, that were particularly striking. Um, but one quick note, um, uh, Vincent has to step out. He, he has to go. We were lucky to have him as a, a guest host today. Um, we'll be seeing him very, very soon uh, in March. He's coming with the, the, uh, This Week in Tech uh, or this week in a uh, virology team, and we're going to do a co-show, uh, a, a combined show of TWIV and, and Futures and Biotech. So th thank you very much uh, for coming on. Mark, thanks it's for having me. Uh, Rudy, good to meet you and nice hearing about your work. Um, and I look forward to a joint TWIV fib. Sorry, I have to run, but we have to do a TWIV now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, yeah, and Vincent does a great uh, podcast that uh, has a lot of overlap, but he, he focuses on uh, virology, um, and it's a panel uh, show, whereas we interview. Um, but I, I, I encourage people to go and listen to uh, This Week in Virology. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and he, he's a, a hell of a great scientist, so uh, it really helps to pull the context. This is really tough stuff, and you, you pull it into the right, uh, you ask the right questions. So have a, have a great afternoon, Vincent. Good luck Thank with you, the Mark. show. Thanks.
Bye, Vincent. Um, so one thing I, 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 I think the, the, the fact that you were able to pull out um, information of, with respect to isozymes, uh, 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 isoenzymes, you, we, you know, we all went through uh, biochemistry, or we all, uh, many of us went through biochemistry class. We, we had the big map. We studied all the enzymes and the pathways. And then genetics revealed, well, there's splice variants and enzymes that do that same function. And here you are. Uh, using a systems approach saying, well, you know, there is multiple pathways that connected there. Actually, under these, these conditions, this is the enzyme and, you know, the um, information that is important. I suppose if, if that's true for mammalian cells, you might be able to identify causes for metabolic disorders whereby that person has the enzyme or he has at least a version of the enzyme that should work, yet the products of metabolism aren't correct. Yes, I think that's that's one of the conclusions that we drew from this study, that we, you might have, uh, out of, of four isoenzymes, you might have three, or a person might have three, and the fourth one is mutated, and it might have pretty substantial uh, uh, implications for that person's or that cell's metabolism. And so it's not the fact that the the product can be made, but it's it's a regulatory, basically a regulatory or systemic effect whether under, under what conditions the, the product that may be required for a normal function of a cell can be made. So I think the, the implication is one needs to not just look at the biochemical function that can this product be made, but also at the whole regulatory environment under what conditions is, what, is, is, this, um, is this function actually carried out, the biochemical function. And I think this is one of the consequences of this study, and I think it has implications also for human disease. I, I have a metabolic disorder, uh, hyperhomocysteinemia, and I sequenced the gene, uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, and guess what? It's normal. So <laughs> I'm like, well, I, maybe there's an isozyme. It's all coming together. We'll figure this out. <laughs> My cure is to take a vitamin B6, which is a cofactor, uh, and upregulates the activity uh, of the enzyme, although not my, not the one we sequenced. So that's pretty or amazing. Maybe, or maybe if a transporter brings in a cofactor, synthesizes a cofactor, I mean, that's the whole point. There is, there's ripple effects and in, in the interconnectivities that I think one wants to get at, one wants to get at uh, eventually. That sort of, I, I guess this would be a good segue um, on your uh, phospho, uh, phosphoproteomic analysis. Um, we're, we're kind of running short of t on time. I, I, I'm wondering, would you prefer... Talking about uh, the phosphoproteomic uh, analysis uh, paper, or would you prefer talking about some of the um, recent methodologies that have uh, have spawned an opening uh, into larger areas of proteomics? I probably would quickly talk about this paper because I think it again teaches us something really important about the interconnectivity of biological systems. And, uh, and I think, the, again, the, the, the experimental setup was rather simple. It was supported by advanced proteomic technology, but I think the finding is quite profound, as again uh, with this other study on the yeast metabolism. So here we tried again in yeast to, to figure out how, what happens to the cell when we eliminate from the cell a particular uh, kinase, and in fact, we wanted to do this for all kinases. So yeast has about 120 protein kinases, and we attempted to delete all one at a time and ask what's the impact of deleting this particular protein kinase from the yeast cell, how does the yeast cell react in view of the phosphoproteome. So, Let me interject uh, here just for a quick second to define what a kinase is for, for, for those yeah, okay. listeners that might yeah, not, not jump up. These are important yeah. molecules. They're enzymes that a, a, attach a phosphate group to another protein. So you've got is this key enzyme that can say, oh, by the way, that glucosidase needs to be turned off. Add a phosphate group, it turns off the function by adding this heavy molecule that then creates a, a switch. It's like, like a dip switch onto the function of that protein. It could say, well, it needs to be turned on at a phos uh, phosphate group onto that protein. That'll turn the function of that protein off. And then there's a 
counteracting enzyme called a phosphatase that removes the phosphate group, which could be a way to activate the function of the protein. So these are key players, right? These are the, the, the intelligent um, molecules that, result, that take information from outside the cell, maybe from inside the cell, and communicate that information onto the players around. They're kind of like the, the coach around each base of a baseball field uh, saying, go, 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 go. Oh, stop. You know? Okay, so <laughs> that might be a great yep, oversimplification. Exactly, that's exactly right. right. So, right. so, or in other words, one could say they process information. Right? They, they collect, co connect to the sensors and then the sensor fires and then the cell decides to do something. And, and usually that involves turning on or activating a particular or kinase or sets of kinases which phosphorylate a particular subset of the proteins that are present in the cell. So we wanted to ask, and, and usually, and classically in every biochemistry textbook or cell biology textbook, kinases are, are frequently uh, represented as, as, as linear pathways. So famously, there might be the MAP kinase pathways, where we have a MAP kinase 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 phosphorylating a MAP kinase kinase, and that, that one phosphorylates a MAP kinase and leads to a kind of a, of a signal amplification and propagation cascade. So we wanted to ask what happens to the cell or how does the cell react in, if, we, if we measure a large number, not all of them, but a large number of the phosphopeptides that are present in a cell, in, in a yeast cell, when we delete one kinase, basically extinct one after the other. Unfortunately, the yeast community, research community has generated Tremendous resources, for instance, strain collections where every uh, protein is knocked out, the deletion, yeast deletion strains. And we simply took these strains, and this was a, a PhD student, Ben Bodenmiller, who did that uh, fairly heroic effort, and measured the phosphoproteome in each one of these kinase and phosphatase deletion strains. And then we started to compile the data in one large data set. So the, the, the date, again, the outcome was... Um, was extremely surprising. So what we initially thought and what the realistic assumption would be, that if you delete a kinase from a cell, that you would simply, the cell would simply continue doing what it's doing and not phosphorylate the substrates of that kinase. So you would basically see a certain, to a certain degree some phosphopeptides disappear and these disappearing phosphopeptides might be largely enriched in the direct substrates of this kinase. So this is, is exactly not what we saw. We saw that for whenever a kinase was deleted, that a roughly similar number of phosphopeptides disappeared or were reduced as were induced or appeared. So clearly the cell will, will, has developed a program that whenever it is perturbed, basically by deleting a kinase, it, it, it compensates um, its network of kinases and substrates so that the cell can, can live on and it compensates in, a way that, in ways that we really don't understand uh, mechanistically at this point. But I think the, the, the finding was clearly there that we cannot think of kinases as linear sequences or pathways of, of events, but really we need to think of it again as a network and a tightly regulated network that if you el eliminate one component, the network compensates and essentially carries, up, carries on doing its function. And we then related these molecular phenotypes at the phosphoproteome level to, to phenotypes uh, that are measurable by light microscopy, such as cell division, cycle or speed, cell size, and, and uh, about a dozen such parameters. And many, and what we found is that many molecular compositions are indistinguishable from the phenotypic um, measurements and, and many relatively little or small perturbations at the phosphoproteomic level lead to very substantial phenotypic changes. So I think there's a lot. So, so the main lesson was that we're looking in kinases and phosphatases as a highly integrated, highly regulated system and that compensates for perturbations in ways we don't understand. The view of linear sequences of kinases and kinase cascades is clearly too limited and that various types of molecular phenotypes do not necessarily or do not correlate in a transparent way with, uh, with, with, with macroscopic phenotypes. That's kind of the, in a nutshell, what um, we, we, we could um, do in this paper.
it's beautiful work and it's it's available publicly um I'm pretty sure, it, and if it is, I'll, I'll put the PDF on futuresinbiotech.com for people to take a look at. Uh, this yep. is a Bowden Miller et al. Um, it's it, it's like we're you know looking at the way this, the results from this paper that uh, the 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 code of life um, and and not the DNA part. The the, the DNA ha is basically. Um, you know the CPU, or no, it's, it's information for the proteins. But um, you know how the the interplay is programmed in, in, ter in terms of signaling and, and communicating information uh, to the living organism uh, through the kinases. It's kind of like you've identified new subroutines that didn't weren't there, um, and that it's a high level language. Uh, and the interplay isn't simply uh, you know basic code with without subroutines. It's just it's a, a high level. Uh, language it's based on core um a, a more core <laughs> kernel i suppose it's pretty amazing stuff this is uh and i i love to see how you know of course yeast uh you know it is is kind of laying the foundation for these these uh, early discoveries but uh i mean taking it to to human uh, level uh and the, the yeah, of course we'd like to do this in humans it's currently too much work and we're too slow methodologically but of course that's the that's that's the goal i mean there's a there's a like any almost any study this created a lot more questions than it actually answered and the some of the initial answers we hoped for didn't emerge but but a lot of more questions emerged and it's like i think it's an interesting study and we will we certainly continue to work on that because we would like to understand how is the cell process information by phosphorylation if it gets two or three or ten inputs through sensors how how does it deal with that and how does it how does it uh how does it compensate? How does it integrate various types of information to come up with a composite output uh, that that is mani manifests itself in a phenotype? I think these are essentially unknown uh, unknown questions. I mean, uh, or uh, questions with unknown answers. Wow, um, this is fantastic. Uh, perhaps um, we could have you on uh, on the next when the next big paper comes out because this is a nice one and we can uh, focus uh, an entire show on 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 one paper because I, i'm looking here there's there's five more <laughs> in the past five months that are just mind-blowing these are great really really solid uh and and frontier work um so i you know i really appreciate you coming on to the show yeah, it was great it's fun thanks um, yeah, this is just, uh, you know, we have to say it's tip of the iceberg, uh, absolutely tip of the iceberg. Um, I, so I'd like to thank our guest. Uh, it was, uh, Dr. Rudolf Abersold, and he's a professor at the Institute for Molecular Systems Biology, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and a professor in the Faculty of Science at the University of Zurich in Zurich, Switzerland. Thank you very much for coming on. It was an honor to speak with you. Thanks, Mark. It's great. Thanks. Um, I'd like to also thank um, uh, our our engineers today. Uh, we had uh, John Slinina and Burke McQuinn. Is Burke there today? I mean, I, I heard there was a, a transition uh, of uh, switching over. Yes, I'm uh, here well, now. <laughs> thanks to both of you for handling uh, audio, video boards, and recordings. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team that make this possible: Leo Laporte, Lisa Kinzoff, Rick Louis, Alina Rivera, Tony Wang, Mike Taylor, uh, John Slanina. He's now he did some engineering. Jeff Stewart and Jason Howell, and the rest of the team in uh, Petaluma, California. Lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Pelsey, Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. Any comments or suggestions? You can contact me at Mark M A R C at Twit TV, or on Twitter at Mark Peltier, or M-A-R-C-P-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.